Okay, if people want to get their seat, we'll get started. Um, so you're all here to see History in the Making. Vice Chancellor Brent Goldberg giving his first um, annual uh, budget uh, briefing as we uh, report out on the budget. Um, you know, the state of Tennessee in terms of tax revenues is, is doing well. Um, our, our budget comes from uh, a few places, um, state funding. I'm going to try and figure out where to stand so I don't get feedback. Um, but uh, I, maybe it's the mic there. Um, state funding, which this year THEC made a recommendation. It wasn't quite what the governor uh, supported. There's about $3 million there that we did not see. Um, but of the state funding coming in <coughs> new to UTC this year, 90% of it is going towards salaries and adjustments and the 5% uh, salary pool. They, I think this year there's 57% of that, of the 5% is funded uh, directly through the uh, state appropriation. Another two million on formula funding. Tuition, you'll see there's an increase built in, but that's another major part of our revenue. Um, we also have almost $7 million from the UC Foundation Endowment that pays out. That's, you know, it's 179 million <coughs> or somewhere right around there. So that's a huge part. I mean, that's a big part of this budget when you look at it. And we're hoping people will think in a more proactive fashion about if you want to accomplish something, let's raise funding, not for an endowment, for spending and sponsoring a project of what you want to get done. So there are multiple ways, you know, and researchers are writing grant proposals to fund research. It's all revenue and it helps us. So um, we'll look today largely at what the state part of this is. I think there's an overview at the end of the UC Foundation so you can see what an important part of the budget it is. Um, but um, and we'll take questions at the end, but I'm going to turn it over to Vice Chancellor Goldberg. <coughs> All right, let's see. It works. It does work. It works. It's perfect. It's kind of weird. I feel, I feel like I'm in, in the future with this thing on. Um, <clears throat> so thank you all for being here. Um, it, like the Chancellor said, it's my first budget town hall. I'm, I'm excited about it. Uh, we've got a lot of great information to share. Um, but first of all, before I do that, I would like to thank a few people. So uh, Chris Sherbisman and Allison Evans. You two have to stand up now. Come on. So I've literally met with them every week since I started five months ago. Um, so they've, they've helped catch me up on budget process, and uh, we've had lots of good discussion and, and, you know, some historical context and all the things that you, you need to get a handle on, on this type of budget. So I really appreciate both of them and all the work they do. Uh, everything that they do uh, is reflected here. Uh, they do all the hard work. I just get to get up and talk about it, right? And then also, uh, Lori Pugh, if you'll stand up. I want to say thank you to Lori. So Lori has done a lot of work around compensation, which we're going to talk about today. Um, just a tremendous amount of work. Uh, we have a lot of good news to share with compensation, but we also have some challenges that we need to share and make sure that we're transparent about. So um, I'm going to jump right in with that brief introduction. I can even make this thing work right. So uh, we'll start out talking about uh, just budget planning for the year. Um, you can see the, the budget process goals on the screen. I want to um, focus on a couple of things. One is being strategic. Another is being transparent. And then uh, seeing that third bullet it says uh, broad broaden inclusion with fiscal planning so those are really important goals to me I think transparency is really the key to, to any budget process um, and the more transparent we can be the better off we will be as a campus and we also need to make sure that we are aligning uh, to our strategic plan uh, I'm sure all of you know we have a strategic plan that is, uh, runs 21 through fiscal year 25 
And uh, that means here in the next probably few months or so, we're going to have to start working on a new strategic plan, right? Uh, that will start uh, in, in 2025. So uh, we always want to make sure our budget aligns to these priorities. That's something that we're required to do from an accreditation standpoint. And it's also just good practice to, have, to be strategic with your, with your budget and align it to a strategic plan. Next, I want to talk about the timeline. Um, you can see where we are on the timeline, third from the bottom. This started back in October. The whole budget process started a couple months before I even arrived on campus. And I, they, they caught me up very quickly. And here we are today uh, with the budget town hall. And then you can see that we have a recommendation to our campus advisory board scheduled for May 23rd. And then the full board of trustees uh, will vote on the budget at the end of June. Whoops, too many. Um, so next I wanna talk about the variables that go into the budget process. And these are all uh, extremely volatile things for a fairly long period of time, right? We, we're playing, we, we do a lot of guessing, uh, especially from January uh, or December through February, uh, and that's when the governor's budget comes out, so we get a little more clarity. But then we still have to worry about other things like tuition. So um, the state appropriations are, you know, until we know what those are, uh, we don't really know what the resources are going to be for us to plan a budget. Uh, tuition fee, tuition and fee increase is something else that isn't just given. You know, we can't just say we want 2% increase or 3% increase. That has to go through a process. It has to fit within THEX binding ranges and we have to uh, get board approval. So all of those things, those resources are always a moving target um, until we get to about this point of the budget process. Um, also, I want to mention that HERF expired, so all the stimulus funding that we had, that funding is no, no longer available, so that changes the decision-making process around certain things around campus. Um, when we talk about the environment, so enrollment fluctuations are critical uh, to the budget, either, either whether they go up or go down, right? Our enrollment really drives a, a large part of our revenue. So enrollment fluctuations are something we pay attention to very closely. Um, uh, is Dr. Freeman here? I don't think us. Oh, there he is. Uh, Dr. Freeman has been giving us fantastic enrollment updates for the past few weeks. Uh, we, we talk about it every week in our executive leadership team meeting. Uh, we know that he and his team are working extremely hard to make sure that our enrollment uh, not only doesn't decline, but hopefully increases a little bit, right? So uh, we, we've seen some good news with, with new freshman enrollment as well as retention. So we are very hopeful with enrollment. Um, Hyperinflation, so that, you all know that that is affecting everyone. Um, it affects you all uh, when you go to the grocery store or the gas pump or any of those places. But also it really affects us as an institution because we have so many unavoidable costs that are impacted by inflation. And we'll talk about those uh, a little later. Uh, fundraising, the chancellor mentioned how fortunate we are to have the UC Foundation. Um, the fundraising environment also uh, has a part to play in the budget process, and then THEX recommendations, um, which we'll talk about on the next slide. We also have to deal with things like system-wide initiatives and projects, right? Even if, uh, if it's not something that UTC had planned on doing, if the system decides we're gonna do it for all campuses, we go along and we, uh, we participate, which uh, impacts our budget. Um, institutional reserve management is also critical. We have reserves, uh, we, we have a, a healthy fund balance, but we have to manage those uh, almost on a daily basis. And I've seen um, some very robust spreadsheets that Chris and Allison look at on a daily basis uh, to manage institutional reserves. And then lastly, uh, reduction reallocation opportunities. So um, that's something that we are gonna have to keep on the radar as we go, depending on you know, if we get tuition increase approved by the board, depending on what enrollment looks like, depending on several factors, we're going to always have to keep those opportunities uh, on the board uh, as we go along. So the next thing I want to talk about are the, the financial resources that we, that we believe we have at this point. So at the top of the screen, you can see the THEC recommendation shows uh, Seven, almost $7.3 million. So that's what THEC recommended for funding. Um, and then they had a tuition and fee binding range of zero to 3%. So that really 
you know, when we started planning early in the budget process, we, we planned to get that $7.2 million. Um, and for the past four years, we've gotten the amount that THEC recommended, and then we got salary pool funding on top of that. That is not what happened this year, though. So as we started going through the process, it really fundamentally changed what we were planning with the budget. Um, you can see operating uh, formula, those first two, if you combine those, that's uh, just under $2 million. So that's how much money we got from the formula that's not salary pool uh, versus $7.3 million. So about $5 million different than what we had hoped for uh, at the beginning of the process. And then we got $3.5 million uh, in salary pool funding, which that does not fund 100% of the salary pool. So, you know, if it's a 55-45 split roughly. So 55% from the state, and then we have to fund the other 45%. Uh, institutionally. And then uh, insurance premiums and benefits, that's essentially pass-through money that we get for, for increases in, in premiums. And then uh, capital maintenance is something that, even though it's not operating, we wanted to highlight here because it's important uh, to know that we got $7.3 million for building envelope repairs. And uh, I know many of you have experienced things like, a, you know, possibly a leaky roof or you know, something wrong with the walls or depending on what building you're in. And we know all these things exist. I see Tom Ellis over there and I know that Tom works very diligently to try to keep water out of buildings. But we have, uh, we have a lot of old buildings on campus, right? And, and while we've been really fortunate to have a lot of renovations and a lot of uh, capital outlay over the past few years, these maintenance dollars uh, are never enough, right? We always need more maintenance dollars. And uh, the state also um, defines what we can use the, those dollars for in a way that makes it less flexible for us. So regardless, it's important that we get these funds from the state. And uh, that's, that's some good news in the budget. For tuition and fees, uh, we are proposing a 3% increase in maintenance fees as well as, and also a 3% increase in mandatory fees. And we'll show uh, that impact here in a bit. All right, so compensation. That's, that is the primary thing uh, we want to talk about in terms of how we're investing uh, the dollars that we've received from the state. Uh, more than 90% of the money that we are getting from the state, the new money we're getting from the state, is going into compensation. And that, just to explain what that looks like, first of all, it, it increases minimum wage to $15 per hour on campus. Um, it provides for some funding to address compression. Uh, and compression is what happens when you raise minimum wage and don't raise all the other wages across the other market ranges. So, for example, market range one, that's minimum wage, $15 per hour. Uh, if you move someone from 13 to $15 per hour, they may become equal to their supervisor unless you increase the supervisor pay. So that's the, the short example of what compression does, but it cascades throughout the entire pay plan. Um, so we're going to start making some investments in that this year, but we're going to talk about uh, what that looks like and why it's going to have to be a multi-year uh, problem to address. Um, it includes money for faculty promotions and rollovers, and then lastly, a 4% market merit increase. So um, when we implement the pay plan, when we increase minimum wage to $15 per hour and we add money to all the other ranges, uh, one through nine, for compression, we're going to then apply the 4% on top of that. So minimum wage will actually be 1560 per hour starting July 1st if everything we're proposing is approved uh, and, and makes it through. So that's really good news, I think, for campus. I think uh, it's exciting for people that are at that minimum wage to be able to get up to $15 an hour. It also creates a tremendous challenge for us with compression, which we will talk about. And I want to be very clear about what that challenge looks like. Some of the other investments and unavoidable costs that we have, um, I'm not going to read all these out, but University High and the Quantum Initiative are two things that I'm sure most of you have heard about uh, several times, and those are really key strategic initiatives for the university. Um, there are some positions across campus that didn't have full funding behind them that are uh, in line with our strategic plan that we need to fully fund um, instead of using what we call soft money to pay for those positions. And then lastly, 
Uh, one thing I want to mention are the things that we just cannot avoid. So property insurance, for example, that increases, we have to pay the increase. Uh, the system, UT system charges all campuses to cover their overhead. That is what it is, we just have to pay it. Um, we have a QEP that we want to fund. All right, I'm gonna count to three and let's say what our QEP is called. Everybody ready? One, two, three. Excellent. Uh, I know that Dean Licka would be very angry if we didn't know the name of this, right? Um, so that's something we also have to fund, right? I mean, it's, it's not, I mean, it's required. It's something that we do. And then lastly, utilities and building maintenance. So utilities, um, we've actually had a decrease in utility costs based on usage because we've had such mild weather in the, you know, for these past several months. However, when you look at the cost of utilities, the rates that are charged to us, our utility costs are actually up year over year with less usage. And that's just a, all, all that is is rates going up and we have no control over it. So that's something that we have to put into the budget. Like we just, well, we could turn off all the air conditioning, but I don't think that would, I don't think, I don't think any of you would like that very much. Um, so that's where we are in terms of compensation and other investments and unavoidable costs. Th this is essentially um, kind of the roadmap to how, we're, how we design this budget this year. So a little more about compensation. So when we look at the minimum wage, um, I just want to remind everyone that we were at 1010 per hour in fiscal year 21. And uh, if this budget is approved on July 1st, 2024, we will be at 1560 per hour. So from July 1st, 22 to July 1st, 24, so two full calendar years, it's a 48.5% increase in minimum wage on campus. That is remarkable. And I think to do that in such a short time frame really shows um, you know, the commitment of the chancellor and others on campus to, to get this to where it needs to be. So that's what the minimum wage looks like. The 4% will be on top of that. And then we'll talk about compression planning. So this is gonna be a four year approach, maybe five, hopefully four years, um, in order to address compression that's going to occur on July 1st. Um, and that's primarily market ranges one through nine uh, is what we're talking about. This is staff positions uh, in all those ranges. And in order to address it, it's gonna cost us around 1.9 million, let's just say $2 million. That's, that's what we've calculated that it will cost us to increase the entry wage for all of those levels and to do all the equity adjustments so that we have uh, separation between all the different positions within the ranges. So around $2 million. That is all, that, that's 572 employees that would be affected, which is 67% of all staff. For fiscal year 24, the budget we're talking about today, um, we wanted to be sure that we, instead of just doing a few ranges at a time, we wanted to make sure we could hit all nine ranges as much as possible. Um, so that means that we're not penetrating as far into the range as we would like, uh, but we're doing what we can with the, with the money that we have available. So we're gonna put approximately $600,000 into compression this year, and that means we still have $1.4 million worth of a problem to solve in the next few years. But this will get us a, a pretty good way down the road in terms of addressing some of the immediate compression issues, especially things like supervisors and employee relationship and what that pay looks like. Um, again, I think it's important to note that the 4% is being applied in addition to the pay plan adjustments. We've not done that in the past, but with inflation the way it is, we felt like it was really important to, you know, that extra 60 cents on that minimum wage uh, could be a difference between someone being able to pay, you know, their electric bill or their water bill. So we wanted to make sure that we applied this to give people the benefit of getting some inflationary adjustment on top of the pay plan adjustment. Whoops. All right, so that's where we are in terms of the, the landscape and uh, the kind of the roadmap to budget planning and where we are now. So next we're gonna talk about tuition and fee recommendation. And uh, 
this chart shows us where we are compared to uh, peers around the state. You can see it's right in the middle. Um, UTK, of course, is the highest, just over 13,000. And then you have Tennessee State uh, around 8,000 at the lowest. We are just under 10,000, uh, 98.48, and that's for fall and spring semester for a full-time student. So we are very, very competitive in terms of tuition and fees. Um, you know, it's, it's cheaper to go here than it is to UT Martin, for example. That will continue to be the case, I believe, after we get through this, this budget cycle. Um, and I just happen to believe that we have a lot more to offer than, than our friends in Martin. Uh, we're close to downtown. We have stuff to do. Um, Yancey told me to say that. <laughs> he really didn't. He didn't. Uh, but no, for, seriously though, I think it really shows that we are really good value for, for the education you get at, at UTC. Um, so we are very competitive with the market. Um, one thing to note, uh, back in February at the board meeting, we asked the board to approve a change to our out-of-state tuition, and they did approve it, and we we're excited about what this could do for us from a recruiting standpoint. Um, what this shows is this is still current tuition without any increase, but what it shows is, is the out-of-state tuition was cut in half, essentially. So what we did was we made our border, we had a, a border rate uh, for border states, we just made that in all other states the same. So all out-of-state tuition is now the same. It makes it simpler to understand. Um, and it also allows us to recruit from places like Florida or Ohio or places like this that we haven't really been competitive uh, in terms of what the tuition range was. So um, the current tuition for out-of-state student was before this change was just under 26000 and it goes down to just under 18,000. So we, we're excited about that, and we hope that that will help us um, recruit even more students. Also, one thing to note, it's a very minimal financial impact. We only have to add uh, 56 new out-of-state students or, or 113 new in-state or some combination for it to break even. So we felt like it was just kind of a no-brainer to, to do this and simplify our fee schedule. All right, next thing I want to talk about is the proposed undergraduate tuition and fees. So you saw that we were just under 10,000 on the previous slide. We are recommending a 3% increase, which would put us just over 10,000. We know that other uh, universities across the state are also recommending tuition increases. So we believe that this still would leave us below uh, UT Martin and below UT Southern, for example. Um, I I'm going to be interested to see where ETSU and MTSU end up on the chart once, because we don't really know what their recommendation is going to be at this point, do we? I haven't heard anything. Um, so bordering state and out of state, you can see, are now the same at 18208. That includes the 3% increase. 3% increase, by the way, is $296. Uh, that's what, it, that's what, what the impact is to, to the student or the family that's paying tuition. Um, and then... You can see the out-of-state with a decline, and then international um, is still where it was. There was no change to the international fees other than a small increase. So next, I want to look at graduate tuition and fees. Uh, you can see the 3% increase results in $314 increase for in-state graduate. And then uh, you can see out-of-state. I didn't mention this earlier, but we... The graduate out of state was already lower than undergraduate. So when we made the change to undergraduate, it also matched up with, with the graduate out of state portion. Uh, and then you can see international there at the bottom. So let's look at the, the fees. The maintenance fee, undergraduate and graduate, as well as mandatory fees, dif differential fees, and um, I'll stop with those. Those all have to be approved by the board. Right, we have a uh, 3% recommendation for all of those. And then you can see next with residence halls, we have a 5% increase in our recommendation. So that's what we hope to get approved by the board. And then uh, for dining, we also have a 5% increase and that's for a, a meal plan restructure. And um, you know, meals, for example, that is, that's one of those things that is uh, directly impacted by inflation. And in order for us to 
be able to provide, um, you know, the same level of, of service and quality of food that we have on campus now, we have to continue to increase with those inflationary costs. Residence halls, uh, you will see in an upcoming slide that we are at capacity with our residence halls. We also know that we happen to be the best deal in town. So even with a 5% increase, we're still going to be uh, one of the cheapest places to live, especially, you know, around campus, but really in the entire city. Um, so that, that increase is necessary for us just to keep up with rising cost as well. And then at the bottom, you'll see um, for parking, we have a, we're recommending a 3% increase um, instead of a 5% increase like we are for the other auxiliaries. We thought that that was 3% gets us to a point where we feel like we can still have the funds that we need to operate and we're going to have to build a parking deck somewhere on campus sometime soon. So um, we have to continue you know, increasing parking and transportation fees in order to have enough money to build a new parking garage. So that's what the uh, proposed fee changes look like. Uh, when you look at mandatory fees, um, you can see debt service. That the, This is current and proposed, so the 3% increase is only gonna impact three of the fees. Um, and this is something that we allocate internally based on what the needs are. But you can see debt service would increase, health services would increase. Debt service is, is because we're, we're gonna have a lot of new debt coming on the books in the next couple of years between uh, UC and some other projects. We also need to build a residence hall and a parking garage. Um, for health services, that fee um, will primarily go to increase our mental health supports on campus. And that's something that, that we know is very much needed and, and Dr. Freeman has uh, made sure that we are aware of that need. And this is, even though it's a small increase, it will be very helpful for what we need in that space. And then you can see transportation, like I mentioned earlier, that's also directly related to the fact that we are gonna have to increase parking on campus um, for the future. So that's what the fees look like. Next, we're gonna get into the actual budget recommendation. So this slide shows the total increase in revenue uh, year over year. So we are proposing a budget that has an increase of 14.7 million in revenue. You can see the sources, uh, the state funding at the top, and then tuition fees. Note that we are using 3.4 million of reserves uh, to fund some of the things that we feel like are important to fund, but that is a fairly significant use of reserves um, in one year. So over on the expense side, you can see we, we just summarize this by unit. So you can see starting with the chancellor at the top, um, many of you are aware that we are in the process of adding an ombudsperson to campus. That is uh, what that represents for salaries and benefits and costs. And then um, I'm not gonna go through each one, but you can see where the recurring dollars are invested. Um, enrollment management and student affairs, that says there's 400,000, that looks like a lot, but really much of that's passed through of mandatory fees, so like the health fee and, and mosaic programming, that sort of thing. Um, the positions that are funded in there though are important as those are recruiting positions that were, that were funded non-recurring in the prior year. And we definitely wanna be recruiting students every day, all day. Um, the other thing I want to hit on is institutional. So that's $8 million of institutional. That includes all of the compensation funding. So that's $5 million of its compensation. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it also includes funding for QEP. Uh, it includes um, a few other things as well. So that's, that's all grouped into institutional. Um, you can see quantum, like research for non-recurring, quantum of a $1 million dollars million dollar investment in quantum is included in that non-recurring bucket. Um, and then you can see uh, auxiliaries down at the bottom. So that's just the breakdown of, of where the, the new revenue will go. So if we look at our handy Eddie pie charts that you're all used to seeing, right? We, we have these every year and it's a very good visual representation of where the money's coming from and where it goes. So you can see tuition and fees is more than half of our revenue in total. Uh, this year's budget will be just over 240 million. 
and over half of that comes from tuition and fees. Uh, state appropriations, 33%, and then you can see auxiliaries and, and a couple other small segments. And then if we look at the expenses by functional area, you can see that the largest one, of course, is instruction, which you would expect in a higher ed institution. And then uh, student services and academic support uh, are pretty large portions. Uh, we have our operations and maintenance of physical plant, and then of course our auxiliaries. So that is what it looks like on the expense side. And then this is what the natural classification looks like. 64% um, of our funds go to salaries and benefits. So um, we are clearly a people heavy business and that's a good thing. Um, and we wanna keep investing in our people as much as possible. Uh, operating makes up the other, well, 34%, and then you've got transfers at 2%. So this is uh, another, I like this chart because it shows you clearly where the money is coming from. Um, so the state appropriation is still our largest portion of our increase, uh, but you can see tuition is also a pretty big chunk of our increased revenues. And then reserves, like I said earlier, is a pretty significant uh, use of reserves this fiscal year. And then this chart shows uh, where we're increasing expenses uh, throughout the university. And the blue is recurring, yellow is non-recurring. So you can see like for example uh, communications and marketing, uh, most of the investment there is non-recurring and that's for for mat advertising materials, recruiting materials, those sorts of things. And then you can see institutional is almost all recurring, or it is all recurring, and that's because it includes a lot of compensation that is a recurring item. Might have died, no, there it goes. Um, <clears throat> this slide is something that you've seen in the past. Um, ever since we started getting her funds, we started adding this into our presentations. Uh, this simply shows that there's no more HERF money. We've used it all, right? Um, <clears throat> and I think it's, um, it's interesting to note that we, you can see it's about half and half between what went to students and what was uh, spent institutionally. In terms of the institutional spending, you can see at the very bottom there shows 12.6 uh, million of that was for revenue loss that we had during the pandemic. 4.4 million was to refund reimbursements and then 10.7 million for um, operations and projects. So we bought a lot of technology and, and things like that with money that we received through HERF. But that money is gone. I'm sure Chris and Allison are excited about this because there's, there's a lot of reporting that goes along with it, a lot of rules. We were fortunate to have it. We're glad it's gone. All right, uh, last section here is uh, financial health indicators for the university. Um, I just have to point in the right place. First one is net price summary. So, um, you know, this was fascinating to me because I hadn't really seen this uh, before. And I just thought it was really interesting. So uh, if you have a family income of between 41000 and 94550 um, the average net price for a freshman in-state undergraduate is only $1,457. So that is the net price after financial aid and everything's counted, which I think is pretty remarkable. If you have an income of 40, less than 42,000, we'll actually pay you to come here. Uh, you know, 19, about $1,900. And then you can see even for uh, the, the families that have a much higher income, it's still, the net price is still 4,000. So. That, that really shows our, our competitiveness uh, in the market. Whoops. All right, this shows our fund balances. So uh, the, the amounts uh, for fiscal year 22, we expect those to remain the same at the end of fiscal year 23. Right, Chris? Yeah, make sure I did, wasn't saying anything wrong. Um, but you can see our fund balance has increased uh, since 2018. Uh, and we are at 9.25 million for uh, ENG, and then we are at a million for auxiliary. THEC mandates that we have uh, a range for our fund balance. The top of that range is 5%, so we are at 4.59 and 4.71. Uh, 
So we're in a really good shape in terms of where we are for, for fund balance. And this is truly like emergency funds that we need to have available in case uh, you know something goes terribly wrong on campus. If we have to dip into these funds, it's, it's not going to be fun for anyone. Um, notes and bonds payable. This also is a, a good health indicator for us with our debt load. You can see um, it's been roughly around $100 million for five years, uh, give or take a little, a, few, a million here, a million there, but roughly $100 million. Um, that's fairly low uh, debt load for an uh, institution our size. Um, it will increase some uh, here in, the, in, I think, in fiscal year 25, which I think is on the next slide. But this gives you some context where our debt has been. And then this shows you um, balances and what our payments are on the debt. So the largest balance is for the North Campus residence halls, just over $52 million. Um, and then you can see all the other... Uh, debt balances that we have out there, the total of the 97 million. Yeah, in fiscal year 25, we'll issue bonds for Wofford Athletic Center, some lighting upgrades on campus, and UC renovations. So that will significantly increase uh, how much debt we have. It's always easy to go borrow money, right? Um, especially when you're an institution, people love, love to let you borrow money. Um, the problem is we have to pay it back, right? So the amount of money that we need to pay it back really impacts our operating budget. Like we have to have recurring money each year to, to pay back uh, all the debt that we borrow to, to build buildings and do fun things. You can see what those payments look like for each one of those debts that are listed. So <clears throat> for example, you can see like Finley Stadium, we're getting close to the end, right? Um, we pay 162,000 a year. There's only 880 left, we're almost there. And I know that uh, our friends in athletics are excited about that. Next, I want to look at the residence hall occupancy rate. So I mentioned earlier that we are running out of space and we desperately need a new residence hall, which we are feverishly working on. Um, we had a program for a residence hall that we started during, uh, well, I guess right before the pandemic, and then you know everything changed. Um, interest rates went way up, the cost to build things went way up, so we, that kind of paused. We are now reevaluating uh, what it looks like to, to get that residence hall um, back on target and, and hopefully start building one in the next uh, couple year or two. Um, but this is what the rates look like. You can see in, in 23, we, it says that we actually had four open beds, but I don't know, Dr. Freeman probably can't find those four open beds anywhere. So <clears throat> we are at capacity. And like I mentioned earlier, it's, um, we, we did a, a study, um, not like a, we didn't do like a full dissertation type study, but we did look around and see what the rates are like uh, in Chattanooga. And uh, the, the amount students pay to live on campus is lower than the average rent for a one bedroom apartment in Chattanooga. And those rates, as you get closer to campus, those rates are higher and higher. So we are definitely seeing a desire for our students to live on campus, uh, even upperclassmen who typically in the past may not have wanted to be on campus. So it's definitely something that is a challenge for us and in order for us to uh, continue to increase enrollment, we have to have more beds and we have to have parking. It's trying. Did it die? Might have died. There. Let's just do this. Let's use the keyboard. Um, all right. Next couple of slides are about the UC Foundation. The Chancellor mentioned this earlier. Um, you know, we are very fortunate to have the UC Foundation endowment. We uh, universities our size do not have this kind of endowment. So. We are very fortunate. You can see what the different components of the, of the endowment look like. Uh, total value, um, we're, we'll round up and call it 180 million. And you can see the different areas. And then this slide shows the distribution. So this is what the plan distribution would look like for fiscal year 24. 
Um, <clears throat> you can see it's you know just over six and a half million dollars, but that is uh, you know operating for advancement, institutional support, scholarships. You can see the academic support, the professor professorships, and then faculty development. So those are all without these funds. Um, you know, it, w it would be really hard for us to do most of the things listed here um, with, the, with the budget we have. So with that, that is the fiscal year 24 budget presentation, and we are happy to take questions. I see one back there. Finally. Good afternoon. I'm extremely grateful for the work that's gone into compensation at UTC. As someone who hires somewhat entry level positions, it's phenomenal to have that support. Mm -hmm. My question relates to what seems to me a, a discrepancy between the market merit increase versus the five-point scale that we evaluate staff on annually, where the market merit seems to lump uh, anybody who gets a three through a five together, and uh, the three through five is actually something that I distinguish with my staff, and I have the good fortune of having high performers, and it's somewhat of a disincentive <clears throat> for someone who is a high performer if they're getting the same mm -hmm. compensation increase. And so it's as if that annual <clears throat> January exercise could be a binary yes, no. I've met expectations, I've not. So I'm just wondering if there are conversations around that at the executive level and what those conversations might look like. Thank you, Joel. That's a great question. And so short answer is yes, there are conversations around this. Um, we talked about it um, a fair amount uh, within the past month or so to really talk about, you know, do we, do we try to do it now or do we, do we do it next year? That's essentially kind of where we were uh, in the conversation. One thing that I think is important to note is we wanted to make sure that we put as much in as possible to so the four percent increase we thought that was really important that everyone who um, is in good standing could get that amount because we want those wages to come up across the board especially with the compression that we're creating with the minimum wage right so you know it's it's a challenge because we want everyone to rise as much as possible this year because of the compression issue we do also understand though uh, exactly what you just described and we've had Others ask, uh, just like you did, uh, about being able to do this. And um, we even had the same, uh, same discussion in academic affairs on the faculty side. Um, so that is definitely something that we have talked about and that we want to build a framework for as we go into next year. So that's something that we will start working on this summer. Um, because we, if we're going to do that, we want to make sure we do it right and we do it fair. Um, a lot of the other campuses do, like for example, um, you know, they'll do, I think this year we have several that are doing a 3% across the board, 2% merit pool, and then, you know, it kind of gets divvied out however people want to divvy it out within their area. So um, I know that is the way one campus does it uh, currently, but we want to make sure that we build a framework that makes sense for our campus and that, that can be applied, uh, you know, across the board whether it's staff or faculty. I mean, I know they're going to be different, but, you know, we, we don't want to do, you know, this one system for faculty and one system for staff. We, you know, it would be nice if we can do uh, a merit pool. Uh, it's not going to be the same. It's going to be different just because of the way they function, but the same concept, I, I guess. Lori, is there anything you would add to that? Good, okay. Hey, I'm Crystal in Student Success Programs. We use Airmark a lot for catering. So since meal plans are going up, does that mean there's going to be kind of an overall cost increase for food and food services on campus? 
Chris Jervisman <laughs> likely definitely has the answer to your question. I think Cedric has a mic. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, it's definitely something that we've talked about in the past few months. Um, <clears throat> so we have about 1,600 student workers in some capacity on campus. Some are very few hours. Some, you know, work more hours as a lifeguard or, or you know, tour guide or whatever. Um, so we have a vast, I, I guess, a, we have a lot of varying types of jobs that student workers do. And if it's work study, it's going to be tied to federal minimum wage, right, which is still seven twenty-five an hour. Um, and then, you know, we have some students who actually get paid like $30 an hour. So the average on campus right now is $10.47 an hour. So that's the average uh, rate for student workers. The minimum is seven twenty-five. The max is $30. Um, and there's just a wide, wide range of what those students do. The other thing that really impacts that is how it's funded. So that's a really big issue is, is you know, what's the funding source for how those students are getting paid? So for example, students who work at the ARC are paid by a fee. You know, that, that primarily funding comes from the fees that students pay. Um, so there's only so much money available from the fees for certain jobs on campus. So that's an issue that we have to look at. I know that Dr. Freeman was, is, has, is looking at it and they are really evaluating, because he has a, quite a few of the student workers in his area across campus. We also have some in, in academic affairs and other places, but I know that, that he was really gonna evaluate uh, the student workers in his area and see what that looks like and where we could possibly go. But it's something that we can't, uh, we just don't have the budget to subsidize this year as we look at uh, where we are with compensation for our full-time employees. But it is something that we've talked about and we do know that there's a need there. So to the extent that funding was available to possibly subsidize some of the, the student jobs, um, we would certainly be open to that. But for this year, it, the money is just not there for us to do that. To the extent we can increase uh, student wages with money that exists. We are, I know that everyone is trying to do that currently. Um, you know, departments that have student workers, um, I have seen in different areas where they've used some operating funds from here or there so that they can increase, say, from 10 to $12 an hour, for example. 
So that is happening across campus, but we, we really need to do a much deeper dive to figure out where we could go with student pay. So administrative support positions will definitely be impacted with the, the investment that we're making to address compression. So all those market ranges, one through nine, will have some investment into the market range. So, um, and Lori, correct me if I'm wrong, a vast majority, if not all, administrative support positions will get some level of increase. All of them will. So. Um, all administrative support positions will, will get some level of increase with the investment we're making in, well, one, 4%, right? But also the increase in the range that we're doing from the compression investment. So that will help. It's not going to get us where we need to be on all those positions. Again, the, the compression is something that's going to take us uh, three or four more years to really resolve. But this is, every little bit helps. And I think this year's investment will get those you know, bumped up to higher than where they are now. Yeah. Yes. No, it is not. So the, the market range one through nine compression issue is staff. For faculty, we do have $300,000 in the budget for faculty promotions and rollovers. Um, last year, we had 325000 for faculty promotions and rollovers, but we also had an additional 175000 for faculty equity um, adjustments. So last year, it was a total of 500000 that went into faculty pay, plus the... the uh, the market merit increase that we had uh, this year it's 325 plus the market merit increase it is something we, we know it's something we need to look at especially um, when you look at lecturers and where they start and then go through the whole range just like we talked about with the minimum wage and up it is something we know that we need to look at um, the provost and I have had some discussions about um, you know looking at what we need to do there as we go into next year's budget. So, 
the chancellor may want to answer some of this. The, um, <clears throat> the endowment, though, I mean, one thing about the endowment is a lot of those dollars, are, we're not, you're not allowed to use them, right? They're, they are put into an endowment in order to generate ongoing operating revenue. So a vast majority of the endowment is not something that we can just use. Um, you want to you say something? That's, uh, what I was going to add is that there's $57 million of the endowment that's unencumbered. The um, UC Foundation is spending $55 million to renovate the housing that they own, which is directly tied to enrollment. So any of the elective type of uh, investments, the grant program, there used to be a broad call. Well, where did that money go? Well, it's going into the housing um, because, uh, so and we're doing it with the revenue off of that $57 million. So it's, we're trying not to use the principal. But that's been a financial um, tightrope, I think, for, for the foundation. And the other part of the endowment where there's a professorship given for the Probasco chair, that's tied to the Probasco chair. Um, there are scholarships tied directly to a donor agreement. We have donor agreements for all of that that spell out how they would be used. And um, in almost every case, it's, you, know, you can use the uh, revenue from the endowment to invest but not even to the principal. There are a couple of places where we can do that, but it's not going to let us um, do this. When you look at the money we have, which is one-time money, and you look at making a $2 million per year investment into salaries, that's a permanent base funded item that every year you need to. So over 10 years, you know, you're looking at 20 million, not just two. So we are going to try to do this over a five-year period. The investment portfolio is managed by a, a group of uh, the endowment committee. It's a lot of, uh, they have a professional fund manager, I think it's EMG, and LCG, thank you. Um, and uh, that uh, there's also a group of fund managers and people who do this for a living in the Chattanooga community who are on our board are associated with that committee. And they really, um, they work really hard uh, for that. So, um, and I don't know that there's a public list, but the found, in terms of what the foundation puts out, but we could, you know, can follow up with the foundation um, I don't know in terms of what kind of restrictions, but we, we try to at, at least you know, follow kind of the values of the university. We're a public university. Um, and so, uh, you know, along those lines. But um, we, we can have a discussion about that too. Um, did we answer that? Do you want to say anything? Do you want to take her off the mic? I would just also say that we work with the campus to be a strategic partner on large initiatives. I would look at Lupton Hall that we put $7.5 million into the Walford Center. And uh, you know, our goal is to keep growing the endowment and to be able to have a lot more flexibility. But the chancellor is correct with $55 million committed to upgrade housing that was built 25 years ago. We feel like that's really a, the biggest strategic partnership that we can and benefit that we can provide right now. That brings in tuition dollars, right? So it, it's a good question. We are so lucky to have this size of an endowment for a campus, a public university our size. We're pretty unprecedented. Um, we are in a wonderful spot. Any other questions? No. So, kind of building on that topic of transparency and also just curiosity, we talked a lot about the freshman adjustment, which I'm very excited to see go down in the next few years. Where can we find exactly how much is going to increase each role? Where is that information going to be published? So, we can, once we get, um, once we get 
through the campus advisory board and then the board of trustees meeting and we actually have an approved budget then we can we can have documentation available for what that looks like but it'll show i mean essentially what you'll see is what the the new entry range entry is for each market range and then everything else kind of follows that but yes that we can publish that uh, once we get past the the um, board of trustees meeting Um, I just kind of had a question, I guess, uh, when it comes to like the student workers pay, I guess I kind of want to question you more about that. Um, I know last time uh, there was this budget town hall, like last year, uh, there was a lot of people talking about the $15 minimum wage campaign and they were told that um, there would be kind of later meetings in the next upcoming semester to kind of talk about that. Uh, is there plans for like, some sort of similar meetings where student workers could kind of maybe express a little bit more of their voice uh, when it comes to this? Because, I mean, I'm a student. I know a bunch of other students that work here on campus, and almost every single one of them, their main complaint is, like, they're not being paid enough for it to be really worth kind of having a job on campus. Uh, many of them have to go off campus. Um, and of course, some of them don't even have vehicles, so that option is not really available for them. Um, I, I hear, of course, that you're talking a lot about like talking to the student workers, but I guess is there any kind of concrete kind of plans for the near future? Sure. So I have probably the largest number of students in my division under IMSA, and we've been talking about with the leadership team there how we increase salaries for students across the board. Uh, there are 100 resident assistants. There are probably a couple of hundred, Cindy, who work, 300 who work in the uh, ARC. Uh, there are tour guides. There are orientation leaders that are there. Uh, Vice Chancellor Goldberg was, was aptly able to address that most of those are fee funded. And when they are fee funded, the funding comes directly as a component of something that the students, the entire student body pays. So for example, in the ARC, the, the um, activity fee that's paid there is the money that's used to do programming and to pay in the ARC. In trying to keep costs down for tuition overall, um, you know, that money gets dispersed and I find myself trying to find dollars uh, in addition to what they are able to, to raise, find dollars to be able to fund the programming that happens there. So it means that the funding has to come from somewhere. Uh, either we cut something in terms of programming or we have to increase the cost uh, for students that go across the board. We are studying right now how we can do this in a very iterative way in my division. So some of the really high profile uh, positions that are there, we've talked about are there ways that we can cut some of the programs or services that are there to increase the cost? Are there ways for private services that we offer for some of the classes, the training that happens in the art? Can we charge those individuals who are coming in uh, outside the institution, can we charge them a little bit more for a swimming lesson or a private birthday party and then pass that funding on to the students? So we're looking right now, I hope we're able to do something this summer in terms of rate increases for students overall. We're looking at the federal work study program to see if there are ways to increase the salary there. It is really incredibly difficult because we have also heard from students, we want to not pay more. And in order to increase the, the, uh, the wages for students, in particular for those fee funded programs, you have to pay more. Uh, students will have to pay more across the board. So we're working on it. It is my full intent uh, for us to try to increase those wages as we go. It will not be uh, as quickly as the university has been able to do it around staff uh, and faculty salaries. It will not be as quickly as that. 
but we should see some movement on it uh, for this upcoming year. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Freeman. The only thing I would add is we have seen the average um, wage increase for student workers. So um, it's, you know, it's around 1050 now, average on campus. It was less than that a year ago. So, I mean, we have seen an increase some. It's, we understand it's not enough for many of our students, but I know that departments campus-wide are actively trying to increase the amount they can pay student workers um, as much as possible with the, the, the funds that we have available. Hi, over here. Um, you mentioned in the increase for tuition for health services with an emphasis on mental health. I was wondering if you could provide more context of what that would look like. I will defer to Dr. Freeman on that one as well. So I appreciate it. it uh, mental health has been one of those things that I've dealt with over the past five years as Vice Chancellor of the Division. It is something that has been incredibly difficult for us to deal with. Our next plan uh, over the next year is going to hopefully be a two-pronged attack uh, with the increase that I hope we're able to get. One of them is to do something around telecounseling for students, something that's going to be after hours. We're hoping to partner with other UT campuses, perhaps something with the Health Science Center. We're waiting on uh, Chancellor Buckley with the Health Science Center to help us with looking at uh, mental health services and how they are able to provide resources uh, and expertise from their campus to all of the campuses across UT. So I anticipate that there may be some dollars spent there. The second piece of this, and I, I hope that this is an innovative sort of idea, we've begun to get some information from other campuses about how they've done it, but it is to put a counselor in uh, the residence halls um, and this person would be there in an after hours way. So we're hoping to do something that would likely be Sunday night through Thursday. Uh, starting hours would be between noon and nine o'clock at night uh, where the person would be there and be available to offer some after hours uh, counseling sessions for, uh, for students in the residence halls. Uh, it is something that I have come to realize we will not be able to pay our way out of. Uh, in terms of staffing, it is something that uh, keeps me up at night in terms of some of the, the things that our students are dealing with. Uh, and so we're hoping to use the increase in fee dollars directly as a result of adding some counseling services, uh, some casework services uh, for students in the residence hall for this upcoming year. Chris, Chris Stokes, Multicultural Affairs. Quick question, you made a reference to a pedestrian mall. Could you share what that location is in the debt service? Yeah, so it's the Chamberlain Field area. I just have a quick question. I know that we are trying to streamline our fee schedule and offer discounts to our out-of-state students, but as we do that, are we making sure we have space for those students uh, as we see the wait lists for students every semester, students trying to get in courses? If we're bringing these students in, are we working to make sure we have courses for those students? So yes. are, the question is, are we making sure we have courses available? We're down uh, 600 students. Yeah. So I was going to say I was I was going to say enrollment is down from where it has been in the past, and we have not decreased, um, you know, the number of faculty or or anything else. So we should have space. I do know that as enrollment increases, uh, we are making sure that we have classes, making sure that we have beds as much as we can. We need to add parking. So those are all things that that we talk about uh, on a weekly basis. The other issue is we had a wait list task force which was very effective in getting sections open and getting returning students in courses they needed to graduate and freshmen into the right courses. I think this past year um, 
know, Provost Hale and uh, Vice Chancellor Freeman um, worked together and with the department heads and deans and everyone, somehow this worked out. It's the first time since I'd been here um, that I, I felt like we really handled it. There was no crisis. So and, you know, we instituted this 15 and 4 tuition. We put a lot more money into bottleneck um, courses and expanded the number of lecturers. And even though enrollment's fallen, we haven't pulled those back. Um, so um, I, I think we have that covered. Any other questions? Is everyone ready to go? So let's give Vice Chancellor <laughs> Goldberg a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.